Welcome everyone. With a London gloom slowly setting in, we have just completed this year's German Idealism course with a round of talks. And I have to say, I think this was probably some of the most excellent talks I've ever heard at one of my seminars. The quality of the participants of the students is becoming ever more impressive. So I'm very grateful to all of you who were there. And some of the uh, students have allowed me to publish their talks here on YouTube. So I will do this for others to learn from them also. They were indeed excellent and imp more, more than, you know, uh, what you would expect um, from such a short, in some sense, a short course, an introductory course to German idealism, this would come out of this, but it, I think it goes to show what's possible when people who are dedicated and motivated to learn and put the work in, um, when they come together in a disinterested way, because as you know, there's nothing that they get from me, not even a PDF certificate or anything of the, of the sort. Instead, uh, what they receive, of course, is a group in which they can learn in an open manner and devote their time purely and solely to intellectual questions, to activities of the mind free from the concerns of the world, which however we should not forget either. So thank you very much to everyone who was a participant on the course. Thank you very much to everyone who's going to listen to these talks here and give these fine people their time and their ear. And if you would like to study with me, you'll find links down below in the description of this video of how and where and when you might be able to do so. Any questions, just leave a comment. Thank you very much indeed. Miguel, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, Johannes. I want to start by thanking you for facilitating this uh, process of learning about German idealism and, you know, the uh, wonderful learning that I've been able to do uh, during this uh, few weeks and to my colleagues here for the dialogue we've had. I want to present some thoughts about uh, a, a notion that is developed by Kant in the Critique of Pure Reason early on as a way to solve a fundamental problem that he has in the, uh, for the creation of the architecture, and that is the notion of the imagination. So that's what I want to be exploring about. So in Kant, what we have basically is the uh, a way of setting up a transcendental structure that, uh, you know, on the one hand, we have the structure of the intuition, sense, sense, uh, the sense experience, which we have, you know, based uh, on the a priori structures of space and time, and then we have the understanding, which is uh, based on the structures of the categories of the understanding, and the question, the problem, one of the problems that. Uh, Kant has is how to bridge those two. In other words, how do we get from sensibility, you know, the intuition into the understanding? And the way that he begins to bring out that connection, that mediation, is through some, something that he calls at times the faculty of the imagination. And this is what I want to talk about because it becomes a way to create that bridge. Uh, and it's a way to, uh, to, and I think how to, the importance of that for Kant and also how, uh, which allows him to also distinguish himself from Hume with whom he is reacting and building on, I would want to suggest. So there are two problems. Um, let me say one of the, one of the ways to think about uh, a lot of what Kant is trying to do and actually subsequent a philosophers to Kant is the problem of unity. You know, how do we make sense of things? And for Kant, he is trying to figure out how do we 
bring, bring together this notion of sensibility, you know, the, you know, what comes to us from the world, the world of senses, and the way that capacity that we have in the mind to be able to, uh, to synthesize the, the, the notion of the synthetic a priori, and being able to make sense of things. And that's one of the challenges that we have in, uh, in Kant. Uh, one, uh, so it's about unity. It's about mediation. One of the problems also that he states clearly at the beginning, and there's a little bit of confusion, at least distinction between what he does in the first edition, which he publishes in 1781, and the second edition, which he publishes in 1787. And in the second edition, he makes some modifications and he identifies a, one of the problems as where did the categories come from? In other words, that becomes a problem. And sometimes that's considered or stated in various places of the transcendental deduction, maybe where we deduce these categories from. And he calls that, but it, in the second edition, he labels that the metaphysical deduction. And then he, uh, he makes the distinction, the transcendental deduction, as distinct from the metaphysical deduction, is connected with the unity of our perception. Namely, how do we make that bridge between the, uh, the, the, the how, do, how, how do these things come together to be able to provide a sense of cognition, to develop thought? And that is where the issue of the imagination comes in. Uh, I'm not going to say much more about the metaphysical deduction or the, the source of where the categories come from because there's been much critique and there's a lot of you know, problems in the formulation of Kant, but uh, that you know is 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 that is he a, is that a valid uh, way of deriving the categories or being able to make the um, you know assertion that these are the categories, the twelve categories that he comes up with, and that you know later on Hegel will say, well, you know, he's just he didn't. He didn't succeed at that. Not only that, but there are other categories that Kant failed to identify. But I'm not going to go into that right now. So, uh, so what I want to say right now is focus on the definition that Kant gives to the imagination. He uh, and I'm I'm not sure that this is to be thought of as a definition that kept, that he sustains throughout, but it's, he states it very strict, very uh, definitely early on in the critique. He says, the imagination is the faculty for representing an object even without its presence in intuition. So let me repeat that again. The imagination is the faculty for representing an object even without its presence in intuition. So there is a, a, a possibility of bridging something that sometimes may not actually be in, in, in intuition. Uh, he does uh, outline the possible that the possibility of experience, you know, and of course, experience is always about phenomena, entails rests on three subjective sources of cognition. One is sense, the second one is the imagination, and the third is a perception, namely how these things are brought together. So he is mentioning imagination there in that list, which suggests that it's a very important part of the structure of uh, the faculties that becomes a mediating faculty. Uh, and so the notion of faculty, that it, it'd be useful to identify is, is something like the power, the power or the capacity that we might have as human beings to uh, examine or uh, you know, uh, to capture something, to you know, integrate something into the human experience. And there are various ways to, you know, there are different elements of that. And what Kant is trying to do is uh, create almost like an architecture of what these elements are. So, um, and one of the things that he does in being able to think about this um, is, he, again, is trying to figure out the, this unity of the apperception uh, through the, and in, in how the imagination itself is a synthetic process. 
So it's a way to bring things together in uh, in a in a uh, in a way that allows the understanding to then be able to uh, integrate these things, which suggests it's almost like a, a different kind of integration. The apperception itself is another level of integration. So one of the ways that one might think about this is that in the process of understanding or the, the, the process of uh, the apperception, namely the way of bringing everything together, there are just different phases of different um, layers of synthesis. You know, there is a synthesis of the imagination before there is a, a the apperception, which is the, you know, the uh, the unity of apperception, which is another unity. And so it's almost like a, a, a layer of, 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 uh, uh, of unities that allow one to have a coherent sense of experience. There's something that, there's an interesting distinction that an important distinction that Kant makes around the imagination. And he suggested two different types of imagination. One is the reproductive imagination and the other one is the productive imagination. And the reproductive imagination is something that could be thought of as like memory or recollection. So how is it that, you know, we have memory? So in memory, if we think about the, uh, the, the phenomenology of memory is something that where we might have an intuition that is actually for which there is not an object there. Because memory, we may be thinking about, you know, something that happened yesterday. So where is, so there is not a, 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 a there is a, an object, but there isn't an object. And this is where the imagination comes in. So the imagination is a way to try to uh, conceptualize how memory works so that we have something uh, like that. So the notions of recollection, uh, and, but one might even think about just simply the way we experience patterns in our perception. And, uh, and that is something that, you know, and how we uh, make sense of these patterns. Um, that is much more the reproductive uh, imagination. In other words, you're just kind of reproducing things. Then Kant also distinguishes uh, their productive imagination, which is a different kind of synthesis. Uh, and this is uh, where one begins to develop a, 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 a capacity for abstractions. And one of the interesting, important things about this distinction is that the notion of the reproductive, the first distinction of imagination is very similar to the way Hume thought about the imagination because for Hume, the imagination was also a very important notion. But for Hume, the imagination was more of a bridge between sense experience and the ideas of the mind. And basically for Hume, uh, the imagination was providing a bridge between them, but there was no necessity. In other words, there's no ability for the mind to simply assert that there is uh, an a priori synthesis, uh, a synthetic a priori. He, he's not able to theorize. He's just able to see patterns. And that is a, a different notion, a very, you could say, a very crude notion of the imagination, which Kant does take in, but then he also adds this notion of the productive imagination, which allows Kant to then uh, posit the notion that there is a synthetic a priori, there is a transcendental capacity that we have to be able to bridge into the idea of being able to have a, a synthetic a priori not, not, not yet knowledge because we have not gotten to the understanding, but it allows for the understanding to be able to create that ability to develop abstractions. In other words, we're able to be pro productive in being able to develop something like, you know, what a theory is, what a, 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 being able to abstract and not just simply uh, be uh, uh, dealing with just sensed experience or just simply patterns of sense experience, which is where Hume is limited. 
So Hume's notion of the imagination becomes very limited. And Kant is actually expanding uh, to add this notion of the productive uh, imagination. There, a, Kant actually then develops this notion of the productive imagination and even the, re, the reproductive imagination by developing these notions of the schemas. And I don't have a, a great deal of time to do to uh, the, to go into that, but in a way, the schemas becomes a form by which the imagination gets structured, and is something a way uh, a mechanism by which uh, a, the this. Uh, uh, intuition is unified in some ways. And he actually gives the notion of a dog. This is something that I be begun to think about. If, for instance, he uses actually the, the, the example of a dog. And I'm thinking, I've, I've been thinking about, you know, how we create a schema, which is a very, uh, it's a, simply as a transcendental notion. So it's a possibility of experience. It's not an image. So there is a notion, there's a distinction between the imagination and the creation of an image. An image is an object. And so in the imagination, we're just talking about a transcendental faculty, which creates the possibility of having an image. But now an image is already a posteriori. Then we're back to Hume, you know, you're, when you're beginning to look at for a posteriori knowledge. But with Kant, he's just trying to figure out how is it that we have a sense of the possibility of knowing what something is. And uh, the, I've, I've been thinking about the notion of, for instance, how do we know what a dog is? There's so many different kinds of dogs. But then how do we distinguish in an abstract, the kind of like, what is it in us, in, uh, in, in some our mental capacity that allows us to distinguish, say, a dog from a wolf? You know, we have an intuition at some point when we see, you know, one or the other, but maybe there is a fuzziness between them. But there's still, there's so a variety of, there's such a wide variety of dogs. But how, what is it in the mind that allows us to be able to create a synthetic structure that allows us to say, eventually, to create a judgment that such and such an entity is a dog. And so, in a way, what Kant is trying to do is, you know, is state a, a priori, transcendentally, what are the, what the structures that allow us to have the possibility of being able to that to do that kind of sense making, be able to, you know, and 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 so he is uh, a, a, a dealing with a number of those ideas. Now, uh, to end, I'm going to say, um, let me see if there's anything else I want to ask at this time. Uh, let, let me just say that I, uh, one of the things that interests me about the imagination to conclude is um, I find that Kant extends in a very dramatic way the notion of the imagination from Hume. And what I want to suggest as well is that the later idealists extend Kant's notion of the imagination in further dramatic ways. And I've been right, right, working on that in the paper, which I don't have time to go to, because how Fichte takes on the imagination in a very substantive way, and then how Schelling does also in a way that allows the notion of the imagination to al allow us to make sense of myth about, you know, uh, symbols and about, you know, uh, and and so we, so what we have is that later. Um, the later uh, German idealists, and one would add the German romantics, began to take off almost like they take off, they go, they expand the notion of imagination in so many directions. So uh, one of the ways to uh, wrap up my, my presentation is to suggest how with Kant, we actually have a tremendous opening, an axial point for the opening of the notion of the imagination that begins to blossom and become extended in various ways. One of the challenges that we may have is how to contain it in a way, because for Kant, the notion of the imagination is still contained. It's not talking about fantasy. When we get to Hegel, Hegel's actually, he, he does, he, he, he actually, 
writes much more about the reproductive imagination, but when it comes to the productive imagination, he uses the word fantasy. He doesn't use the word reproduct in your productive imagination in the philosophy of mind. And that is something that, you know, but he's also trying to contain even the notion of the imagination with from all of the other possible uh, uh, how other philosophers are saying. So I find this uh, question about the imagination really uh, fascinating from a philosophical point of view, but also how it has applications. You know, in terms of, you know, in our time, how do we think about how the imagination plays into so many domains of our own way of sense making about life, about the future, about how we think about, you know, uh, possibilities and, you know, ways in which one could say that imagination goes haywire. But, uh, but for Kant is much more contained. So let me just stop there and thank you, uh, Johannes, and thank you everybody for listening. Okay. Excellent talk. As I mentioned to you in an email, I, this is a book proposal. So keep working on it. If I have a question, but uh, if there are any questions from you, you should go first. Anyone? I have one. Okay. Here's my question, short question. You said at some point that the um, imagination is, especially the productive imagination, uh, you put it much better than I can now, Some, in some sense, make sure that we're not just taking in sense perception. Would you see on your reading, would you say that <clears throat> in what sense does the productive imagination connect to the categories of the understanding? Is it in some sense contained by them or is it in some sense even not contained entirely? Um, I think that actually that is a debate in, in Kant because sometimes he looks at the imagination as part of the intuition and sometimes he links it as part of the understanding. And so it's more, you know, he's kind of like, goes a little, and it, there is a way, I think there is a quote at one point where he almost suggests that you actually need both uh, because it becomes a mediating um, category, a, a process to break, create, create that bridge. And it's more, you know, one of the ways that the, that he locates it much more within the intuition rather than in the understanding because it's pre, uh, assignment of the categories, but is, you know, what is needed in the, when we, in, in you know, I get sense experience from the manifold, from the kind of nubula, nub, uh, nebula of our experience, and begin to get some kind of organization of it, organization of our sense experience, which I think is what he is trying to suggest that the imagination does through the structures of the schemas. That the scheme, the scheme, mm -hmm. I, I use the word, the word schema, a schema is singular, schemata is plural. I yeah. sometimes anglicize the plural to schemas. But yeah. it's how, to, how that is, so it's a way of organizing the sense experience before then we are able to understand, they put in the categories of the understanding. I don't know if I'm answering your question, Johannes. Uh, oh, did no, you but... restate it? You know, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, yeah. It, it's it, 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 there is ambiguity in Kant, in my view, as he's just trying to figure out how to provide yeah, yeah. this link. Good, thank you. I want to make sure if anyone has a question, raise it now. Uh, if not, maybe we go on to. Uh, so I, yeah, I have a. I don't have a question quite, but I think it's something similar to what. Your question is, Johannes. It sounds as if like imagination is has sort of some kind of irrational, might have an irrational side too. I mean, in the fantasy, there is no sort of limit one could go. Or, I mean, people uh, experience hallucinations. That sort of, you know, uh, something that is not there, but we experience and believes it too. Just like maybe that's part of imagination too. Uh, although, Miguel, you said 
Kant is ambiguous about it, but uh, is there something that you could say about this? Whether I, I think that's a great question, Barris. Uh, first of all, I think one of the it's useful to distinguish uh, the imagination, which for Kant it's an a priori, a transcendental faculty, a capacity that we have to, for instance, how do how is it that we're able to have images, myth, make sense of them. And the other is actually the images themselves. So one of the things that, you know, if we are able to have uh, images of various things, now we're moving to the realm of psychology. And this is one of the things that is a, it's a subtle thing, but actually a very profound thing in Kant, is how do we separate philosophy from psychology? Uh, because if we're looking at people having thoughts about you know, unicorns, you know, riding through some other, you know, we are now talking about fantasy, but we are now looking at objects. But what is it? What Kant is trying to get at is the capacity that we have to be able to have things that actually bring meaning. And because he is still in a way of containing, it's not just kind of like, irrational rationality is just nonsense. I mean, because one of the things that, you know, I would, instead of using the categories of being irrational, because I guess us into you know, what is rational, but I will simply say nonsense, kind of like the chaos of, you know, that we have in, you know, in, uh, you know, in, in just sense experience. But it's how is it that the imagination is a sense making? It's a, a mechanism for us to be able to integrate something about the world, about the way we experience it, uh, not just simply yeah. wild on it. I don't know if I'm answering yeah. your question, Barris. <clears throat> uh, beautiful, thank you. I mean, it's just kind of clear certain things. Uh, right. And also, I mean, if you were to share your paper, I would very much interested in how Fichte and Schelling, you know, worked on this. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Larry. It's very much a work in progress. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a, let's say a progressed work in progress. So, and, and it's an accomplished work in progress. So you You're have Barish's kind. email address, I, because you know I, we, we have it all in the email chain, so you can start emailing each other. Uh, and maybe you do email, it, Barish. Do it directly. Yeah. Uh, just one quote from Khan, and then we move on to Nathan. Thank you for answering answering that so well. Uh, here's a quote from Khan, the land of shadows is the paradise of dreamers. Here they find an unlimited country where they may build their houses at libitum, uh, meaning at their pleasure. So this is Kant on Swedenborg on his, in his text, Dreams of a Spirit Seer. Kant was not too taken by uh, Swedenborg, who had a very, let's just say, a vivid imagination. Uh, uh, <laughs> So, okay, excellent presentation and good question there. Um, Nathan, please, if you're ready. Born ready? I, I'm gonna, yeah, I was born ready, but I'm, I'm as ready as I'm gonna get. Okay, so, so the topic that I'm gonna be talking about is uh, um, the relationship between the understanding and reason in Hegel and how it relates to and and diverges from the notion of Lassen or or Gelassenheit for Heidegger in the relationship to uh, what he calls Gestell or a technological way of thinking that becomes kind of all encompassing. So. Um, I'm just going to kind of run through some of the ideas that I have on um, for Hegel. I mean, this after like reading Hegel for three weeks, this is what I've come up with. So um, for Hegel, the way the way that I understand it is the understanding and the reason. Understanding and reason are not faculties of the mind, but they're moments of thinking. So the intention of this exploration is to, first of all, discover what these moments of, of thinking are and go into 
what the what the consequences of is is of the failure of reason to step in and um i don't know if mediate is the right word but to step in and have the the moment of letting go that kind of frees up the understanding from its kind of single-minded focus and secondly to think through what gelassenheit or uh das lassen means for heidegger and how he sees that as the appropriate or authentic resolute response for uh gestell he even says that it's the the, the possible saving grace of having a free relationship to technology is being able to cu cultivate this capacity for, let's say, letting go. So, <clears throat> first of all, the understanding in Hegel and how the this this moment of thinking moves in in our in our thinking, and the way that I understand Hegel going through this whole process, right or wrong, is the movement of self understanding becoming aware of itself, I guess, in some sense. So in the last lecture that we had on Hegel, um, I, th I think it was Nate, someone mentioned that Hegel, what they liked about Hegel was he wasn't afraid of uh, paradoxical thinking, right? He's kind of a paradoxical thinker. And that we pulled apart para, you know, the kind of meaning contrary to and, and doxa, which means opinion in Greek or uh, representation as a moment of thinking that wants to hold on to or corroborate something, which is also the, the that's the understanding in Hegel is this moment of thinking that holds on to um, or corroborates a thinking. So the, uh, the understanding which is always viewing or uh, empirically looking at something and if it can't understand or make sense of what's being investigated instead of trying to um i think hegel talks about to sublate so instead of trying to think through it and reconcile it or bring them together in some way um in which I guess oppositions can be seen within each other. They're kind of reflected in each other. Um, the this shows up for the for the understanding as a lack or a void, and it's something that needs to be filled in in some sense, right? With more data, more information, and um, the response of the understanding is in, when there's a perception of lack, is not to reconcile, but to it's a technological response, right? So it's it's kind of a compulsion to make it available, to diagnose it, to investigate it, to to bring it through all the way to its conclusion. Uh, in that sense, and what Heidegger and, and Heidegger has a, a term for that called, um, we'll say, present at hand, making something present at hand, or to lay something make something fully available right nothing nothing hidden and in heidegger this this kind of thinking if it goes unchecked and I'm, and by the way i'm not sure about what the relationship of this is to hegel so i'm interested to hear your questions so if this type of thinking goes unchecked it can devolve into what heidegger refers to as gestell which is a mode of of revealing in which it's a it's the technological mode of revealing um, which is, it's kind of a, 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 con, a compulsion or a striving after more. It's almost a, almost a pathological desire for optimization, right? Where you turn the self and the world into an object of use, right? Like kind of a, kind of a commodity. And that this can become a totalizing con collapse of beings into hegemony, right? Where you have, nothing is, nothing is dissimilar. Everything is, everything has is is the same um so that's kind of my brief understanding of the understanding for hegel mixed read through a heidegger lens i guess and then the the, the reason or lassen or letting go for hegel 
Um, if the understanding is a necessary moment of thinking that allows for um, that allows for becoming being seen through in a kind of sin, single minded approach, right? A diagnosis or an investigating um, the that moment is necessary. And it also allows for, I, I guess, the completion of, of thought by being focused on like one way of thinking. The, the reason steps in and allows for a loosening of that grip or, or a letting go of that, that kind of thinking um, that allows for more self-understanding. That's how I understand reason so far. So I'm just going to, um, there's a quote from Hegel that I pulled from Stephen Holgate's uh, book on the opening of Hegel's logic, I think is the name of the book. Um, and he says that absolute knowing, Hegel said, consists in, quote, this seeming inactivity, which merely contemplates how what is differentiated spontaneously moves in its own self and returns into its unity. And that, unquote, that's Hegel. And that this readiness to let go of oppositions by letting them undermine themselves is required. So the reason why I pulled that quote out is because he mentions this seeming inactivity, or um, it's an, another way of saying that would be a kind of passivity um, that we might wanna say, it's a passivity, but it's not a pure passivity, but it involves a, a resolution or a, a resolve to allow in a kind of non-attached uh, comportment or disposition or a willingness to engage with, engage with the matter of thinking such that something else can be emerged or something else is allowed to reveal newly. And Holgate says, quote, consciousness progresses, therefore, by losing its certainty of itself, letting go of its initial conception of itself and its object and coming to understand itself in a new way. Consciousness moves forward purely because it loses the apparently firm ground on which it believes it stands, not because it's pulled forward teleologically by the lore of absolute knowing or driven forward by some presupposed power of dialectic. So what I hear Stephen Holgate saying there is that the reason is what allows for this kind of mature or maybe a more enlightened self-consciousness consciousness that's not threatened or compelled to fill in any 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 perceived lack or void but the resolute response by consciousness as a it's a restraint that's not just pulled along by a kind of thinking that is thinking through what it already knows and is a corroboration of what it already knows like that type of thinking and that that moment is a restraint or a releasement such that something else can 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 emerge um, except for, I think for Hegel, this is a movement of consciousness taking a step back so that it can become more aware of itself and to become more determinant and then to take another step back and to become more of aware of, it, of itself. So there's sort of this, this moment, these moments of letting go of, I guess, a, a reification type of thinking to step back and become more more aware. So it's this process of, of becoming more and more self-aware as far as I understand it. And Holgate states that each shape of consciousness is thus forced to let go of its certainty by its own act of trying to confirm it. So that's how, that's how I understand the, 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 the movement and the moment of thinking that, that is uh, reason or this lesson. For Hegel. And now I want to just kind of briefly touch on um, 
the I guess there's some similarity and also there's divergence in what Heidegger, Heidegger refers to later in his thinking as Gelassenheit or, or releasement or Das Lassen as a response to this kind of technological way of being revealing itself, which gives rise to a kind of thinking that is purely technological and purely after optimization. Um, so the letting go that that requires that that releases us from this 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 kind of thinking is um, it's not identical from from Hegel's ver notion of of um, reason, but I'm trying to think through what what that is. So. I'm just going to have I'm just going to go through a couple of quotes from Heidegger as as a way of kind of getting access to the way that he thinks about that. So in uh, his Lothor lecture, he's re he's reflecting on what he wrote in Time and Being, which is a late it's a later work for Heidegger. He says it it is a matter here of understanding that the deepest meaning of being is letting das lassen and letting beings be this letting is something fundamentally different from doing in the text time and being i attempted to think this letting still more fundamentally in the expression giving or es gibt and I have another quote from heidegger where he says that releasement lies if we may use the word lie beyond the distinction between activity and passivity because releasement does, releasement does not belong to the domain of the will so there's some relationship actually between what heidegger talks about in being in time where and Schlossen, which is um, in Schlossen height, which is this kind of uh, this resoluteness or this authentic response, is a is a moment where we can step back from the prevailing opinion of the prevailing opinions of Dasman, this kind of reified thinking that we always are always already in, and there is some relationship, I think, between this uh, between. Um, Entschlossen and das and, and entlassen. There's some sort of relationship there, um, but anyway, the, what I what I noticed the the, the 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 similarity there is Hegel is talking about reason as a as a kind of passivity that's not simply just there is an active passivity I guess in some sense right it's it's a comportment it's it's a it's a it's an awareness that steps back and allows something else to be revealed and i think that's very similar to what heidegger is mentioning in um in his later thinking when he's talking about um gelassenheit um so heidegger, for heidegger the prevailing approach of the of the metaphysical tradition um prior to him which he lumps hegel into rightly or not he speaks of beings as static objects and facts that have been kind of, and, and that the tradition has lost its ability to hear the saying or the self-saying of being that the Greeks heard. And by highlighting this kind of letting, Heidegger thinks it takes our attention away from just sheer presence of objects and it, and, and it can make us more sensitive to Um the actual emerging and the coming to presence of beings that that kind of focus on presence covers over the the spatial temporal allowing of or, or the the coming to be and passing away that that heidegger hears in um hen and logos and uh and uh, aletheia and all of these and fusis this kind of the, this greek experience of of being and I, I think for Heidegger, the, the Gelassenheit is a response to the technological way of thinking that allows for that to re-emerge in some sense. Um, Heidegger says, quote, it is no longer the presence and, and Wesenheit of, of, a, of a being which draws one's attention, but the ground 
which that being covers over, the temporal spatial ground, in order to make itself independent from that ground. So there seems to be also some, some um, relationship to Hegel's thought there. Um, and Heidegger actually mentions in Time and Being that it's this moment of thinking that allows for thinking, for the thinking of being without beings, where one finally stands before being qua being or being as such. And that's where I think the Gelassenheit leaves us with Heidegger is it allows for that emerging. And there's something as well where Heidegger talks about the the, the bewegtheit, the movedness of all things in and out of in and out of presence that's only that we can hear. And that I think is the the, the kind of phenomenological approach that the later Heidegger will take instead of thinking about it in terms of light and seeing and the clearing, it moves into this more idea of listening for and hearing that kind of movedness that the Greeks experienced as the movement of, of being. Um, so I know that, um, that Johannes, in, in your email to me, uh, you were saying that for uh, Hegel, that there is, a, there is a more and more determinateness that arises out of the, the, the moment in which reason steps in. So I actually don't know um, I can't really speak to that. <laughs> so this is a nascent uh, kind of uh, exploration. But those that that's my that's my beginnings of reckoning the idea of understanding and reason in Heidegger and Hegel. Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> if there are any questions, raise them now. Yes, Miguel. Yes, uh, thank you, Nathan, for a wonderful, provocative um, discussion. And this is uh, very helpful because one of the ways that I'm hearing you is that you're trying to uh, unpack what I see in both Heidegger and in Hegel as different forms of passivity and different forms of activity. And, you know, how is it that one is engaged with life or whatever? And how it engages us, and and in, for instance, in your last points, where uh, you're talking about, uh, you know, even comparing Hegel and and uh, and Heidegger, because in Hegel there is a certain kind of uh, at least when one gets to absolute knowledge, which was what you talked about earlier, you know, that at that point one basically has a, gained a certain kind of reconciliation. Of the dialectic, this is much more like an endpoint. But the process itself of the, if one looks at self-consciousness as an ongoing process, it is actually an act, an active process of trying to work out and figure out all of these forces that we need to, uh, that are pushing us in various directions. It's more like this ambivalence of life that is the struggle of life, and so there is a kind of activity of the self in the process of achieving self-consciousness um, that eventually gets to absolute knowledge. And there you kind of have this reconciliation, a kind of passivity, but that is kind of like idealized you know, at the very end. But for Heidegger, there is a different, uh, uh, there's a different sense of that, um, uh, at least in the, what we, looks at in, 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 in Gelassenheit is that some kind of openness, that kind of, it, it, even, which is very different in my view, although you try to link it to what he does in Being and Time with, uh, in, you know, in Lotion's side, in, 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 in Lotion's side uh, the notion of resoluteness. And to me are very different. This is a big change in Heidegger from the emphasis on resoluteness, which is to me very active. You know, the, the self, in having to kind of like live, you know, being able to, you know, being resolute, having a sense of positiveness about life. But in uh, in 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 Gelassenheit, there's much more of an opening. 
an openness. So even then, as he developed the notion of uh, uh, Alethea, it's an opening. Is how you uh, open yourself to uh, to what could be revealed, uh, to possibilities, to you know, and uh, and I think so. So let me put it as a question because I, I, I just I fascinated by you were saying, but is that if it may be useful in comparing Heidegger and Hegel to look at different kinds of poss- uh, uh, kinds of activity, ways of being active, and different ways of being passive. Mm. You know, with in in the last kind of Heidegger, passive. One of the kinds of passivity is what you lo- talked about listening. You know, which is kind of how do you listen to, you know, to to what has to be said to. So because the notion of aletheia is not something, it's not a kind of knowledge one gains by actively going out and learning. It's actually a kind of knowledge one gains by being open to it, by allowing it to come to us, not us going to it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. I don't know if there was a question in there, but I can respond to what you said. Um, I, I would, I would. One thing I will say is I would caution or invite you to think through a, a Schlossenheit in being in time a little bit differently, in and not in such a willful way, because I think already present there is a willingness to be open to, for example, death in a way that has a fundamentally and profoundly transformative effect on life. And that it's not, so I think in a lot of ways, what will come up is a lot of times death will send us running in, in, in different directions, right? And that the willingness, if we can say it that way, or the resoluteness to just be with that experience, allows for something else to be revealed where we don't try to deny death and we don't try to control death and we don't try to do anything with it i think what heidegger does is that he realizes that this was kind of and i don't know and i don't know if this is right but co-opted by the kind of existentialist tradition that read being towards death as a kind of a, a holding it a, a bay or some something like that Whereas I think already, all, already in being in time, Heidegger is talking about an openness. Anxiety for Heidegger, even at that time, involved a calmness. That when one was willing or, or, or was willing to be open, that what is revealed is not a franticness that comes out of Das Mann, right? This kind of response. And I, so I think it's already, I think that it's already there, that the idea of not being towards death, but being with death in that sense is what is revealing. And I think later on, what happens is he does move more in this direction of being sensitive to and being open, that openness. Um, so that's what I would say about that, because I do think that the, the active passivity I think of it almost like in, in meditation or something where you're, where you're doing, you're quote unquote doing something, right? You're not just like, you're not just sitting there hoping something happens. It really is a readiness or an openness for something to be revealed. And there's no telos, there's no need for it to come from something that you already know. There is a, an openness for something to be revealed that is totally not from the past or from what you already know. And I, that's the sense in which I think it, what you're saying is, is exactly right. There, it's, it's a passivity that is an action um, in, that, in that sense. Excellent, very good. Thank um, you. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you, Nathan. Very good response. I'll just very, keep very brief and then we go to Susan. Um, I would say also that this is one way then we can see the relationship of what scholars have turned into Heidegger 1 and Heidegger 2, uh, where they seem to make out a schism between the first Heidegger and the second Heidegger, which is quite representational, right? But it is in Entschlossenheit, which means to be disclosed or being opened to in a resolute way. So there is a resolve there, but the resolve is to be open, to be thrown or to see that thrownness, as it were. Uh, And I think... Uh, there we can begin to see how 
but there's other ways also how the early Heidegger connects to the later Heidegger. Very good uh, discussion you had there. Maybe Susan then, uh, with a precise five minute talk. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do, do have, Nathan, do you have a question? Oh, sorry. No. no. Okay. But, okay. Susan, it's you. the floor is yours and I'll be quiet. Okay. Um, so Stephen Holgate's book, An Introduction to Hegel, Freedom, Truth and History, suggests that Hegel's philosophy is thoroughly and profoundly a Christian one. My talk today briefly explores Hegel's writing on the Christian faith, which provides a unifying quality to the core elements of truth, reason, nature, freedom and geist or spirit. Hegel's writing on being nothing and becoming can also be more clearly understood when seen within the wider context of Christianity. Central to Christian faith for Hegel is our recognition that we are nothing and only sustained through the grace of God. We acknowledge our nothingness through acceptance of death knowing it's God's will which frees us from the fear and anxiety that hangs over our life. It is only through this process of acceptance and letting go that we discover a rebirth and into new life. Because we are no longer afraid of death or life, we gain freedom and peace to live in an unconstrained and open manner. So faith brings about an acceptance of death, knowing it's God's will, which releases this burden from the believer into a new life of freedom through the work of the spirit. While Hegel states that sin, our own and others, is always present, it is through God's faith and love that our life is one, as Hegel remarks, unadulterated cheerfulness. For Hegel, the consciousness of the Christian is not alienated, unlike Marx, as a sigh of the oppressed creature. On the contrary, for Hegel, consciousness is whole. It is freely liberated from the constraints and slavery of death and into a life in the spirit of love. Hegel does accept we are born with dependency which can be maintained by forms of authoritarian church structures. However, Hegel sees this continued dependence as a perversion of the Christian faith, and certainly not one of proper realization. Faith is also consciousness of the truth for Hegel, the true nature of God as Geist or spirit, and of the true nature of the human spirit. For Hegel, True freedom is being freed to be our true and authentic selves through Christ. Hegel's view on human freedom and the will departs quite strikingly from Kant, Victor and others. Kant understands religious faith as duties that we ought to do. For Kant and Victor, it is a moral consciousness bound by laws that constrains its ever reluctant will. Hegel describes this as an unhappy consciousness. Forever bound by laws, it cannot possibly fulfill, forever caught in the struggle between duty and inclination. In contrast, Hegel's writing on Christian faith is not bound by laws and obligations or by duty, because it is the consciousness of being that is reconciled with God being filled with the spirit of love and being transformed in accordance with God's will and what is right. Faith knows that it is love led by the spirit and not under the law. The law simply, the law simply makes us aware of our inability to carry it out for our own self-striving efforts, which leads us to self-despair and to turn to God for help. This is referred to as being poor in spirit in the Sermon on the Mount. 
In this way, faith is discovered and arises out of a personal journey and cannot be imposed by another person or institution. Hegel's view is that we are recipients of the unconditional, unmerited love of God through Christ. This frees us from any sense of inadequacy that we fall short of the demands of the law. God opens our hearts to the spirit and to other human beings. There is a releasement from a sense of moral duty and obligation by transforming our will into one that issues acts of love willingly and without restraint. At the heart of the theologies of Hegel and Luther, a man is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Hegel states that both personal freedom and love have their source in faith, that individual freedom is inseparable from love of others. The life of the Christian faith and freedom within oneself is a life of openness to love for others as opposed to seeking one's own. The Christian does not live within themselves, as Nietzsche suggests, but in Christ through faith and his neighbour through love. What the believer receives through Christ is fully realised through community with others. It is only when we allow ourselves and our own concerns to be displaced that, as Apostle Paul states, it is I who no longer lives, but Christ who lives in me when our hearts are turned towards the good of others. So in conclusion, change for Hegel has a fluid, organic and emergent quality. It is not imposed or forced. It arises at an individual level through faith and the transformational power and working of the spirit through the love and care of others. It is reflected in the practices and activities in the believer's family and community life at work, church, and as a citizen of the state. One possible question for discussion is, does it matter if Hegel's work on the Christian faith was misunderstood by the philosophers that followed him, such as Marx, uh, Marx Nietzsche, and to a lesser extent, Heidegger? Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much, Susan. <laughs> Excellent. Any questions, please? In fact, I should say, Susan, you came in, what was it, January or February, whenever that course started. So this is, it's August, you see, it took only seven months. <laughs> yeah, it was well written. I mean, you know. Thank you. Uh, I have a remark, but anyone, any questions specifically? No. So it's... If something comes up, just raise your hand. Um, what to narrow it down exactly? I think, as you say, uh, Hegel criticizes Kant especially for his entire moral philosophy to be for empty formalism. Um, so that, for example, the categorical imperative—it's—it's it's all. It comes from the outside, but the strange thing about it is, at the same time. It is void. I mean, not void is the wrong word. It's 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 empty. There's no there is a law, but the law has no letter, as it were. There's no content to the formal uh, structure of the um, of the categorical imperative, for example, of the moral law. So, and this leads Kant to some, you know, when it actually is tested against real life examples, for example, should you lie to a murderer at the door who's after your friend, whether your friend is at your house or not, Kant will just go as far as saying, you know, you can't. There's absolutely, lying is absolutely never allowed. So what's cancelled out in a certain degree, to a certain degree with Kant is what Hegel refers to as ethical life, Sittlichkeit. And one way of understanding spirit also would be human-minded activity. Uh, that's not all to it. Um, but yeah, and I would also agree that there's certainly after Hegel, there is a certain uh, subversion uh, through Marx. Maybe not so much by Nietzsche because Nietzsche doesn't really read uh, Hegel. And when we get to Heidegger, Heidegger is, is no longer a Christian thinker. 
uh, and and I think cannot be because of how deeply his thinking was moved by the insights uh, of of Nietzsche. Um, but uh, but Hegel himself, his philosophy, I think, can only fully make sense when we understand his uh, his belonging to, especially not just any Christianity, but Protestantism. Luther, most importantly. Um, so that's just my remark. And okay, so I'll pick up on a few things you mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so originally you were speaking about Kant and you were talking about, um, you know, whether you should tell a lie. If we were to follow what the Bible says, um, the second and most greatest commandment, according to Jesus, is to love others. So I think that would come into it. And I think that um, there can be a misconception um, in terms of what sin is. It can be tied to something that is moral and law. Whereas ultimately, it is um, sin is where we do not go along with God's will. Um, the other point is around spirit and law. Um, I, what I would say is, and I and I picked up on this with um, Heidegger and um, his understanding of, of the will, and I think that it is based on. Uh, and I think when you had your talk with. Um, with James or he alluded to this, um, it was, it's very much based on this kind of rationalist perspective of, uh, of religion, which is very different from what Hegel is describing. And um, so it's actually, it's, it's, it's very different. And, um, and it's, it's a kind of dead man-made man -made religion. Um, the other thing is, is church. Church, um, we can get into isms. And uh, what I would say is that um, a Christian does not get too caught up in, you know, I'm a Protestant, I'm a Catholic, I'm a Baptist, I'm this, that and the other. If we were to actually go along with the, uh, with the Bible, it talks about the body of Christ. And um, this is a you know, a group of believers, it's not, a, it's not a building. And I think what happens is you get people like, say, John Wesley, you know, who um, is basically involved in a revival within the, within the church. And he ends up getting labeled as kind of Methodism. And, and that's what happens because um, of how people step in and then try and kind of rationalize it. Um, but it's ultimately a, a body of, of believers. And Hegel actually, interestingly, is, is talking about how the structure of the church can itself, um, you know, um, kind of influence um, what God's will is in, in a detrimental, in a detrimental uh, way. But just going back to my original question is, is the implications um, this has, I think, in terms of how um, Heidegger talks about the will. I haven't really properly started talking, uh, reading about Nietzsche, so I need to start um, yeah. reading <laughs> about that. Um, so, yeah, um, there's something that I now forgot, but with Nietzsche, um, and I think James mentioned that his talk fits nicely with yours, so we'll go to him uh, next. Uh, uh, very good response. Yes, uh, it, it is about uh, the genuine community. Oh, now I'm coming back to um, what Heidegger, as it were, attacks a theology or or the philosophy of religion for, is, as you mentioned yourself, the overly rationalistic, almost at some point, uh, mechanistic view of God. Uh, in fact, in in uh, Descartes. God is a, is a hypothesis. It's a necessary supposition uh, that is required as a metaphor to connect ego, subject, and world. Um, in, 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 in Spinoza, God is the causa sui, the self-causing cause. So uh, again, uh, not uh, 
you know, this, this is why when, when we get to Laplace, when he says to, and I think I mentioned this during one of the seminars, he says to La, Napoleon, when he asks him, where's God in this equation? And he says, I no longer require this hypothesis. It's a long trajectory in modernity to ultimately uh, get rid of the divine. And with Nietzsche, you'd have to read the genealogy of morality and the passage on the madman, which is not too long, in the gay science. So those would be the two men, maybe beyond good and evil also. So they usually come together, beyond good and evil in the genealogy of morality. Okay, excellent. First question, look forward to more from you. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Susan. Uh, Dr. Simkin, it is my great honor to have a Dr. Simkin present. <laughs> Where is he now? Um, uh, can you hear me? Is it, can you hear me? Yes. Were you yeah, too uh, humble to accept the um, the you know, just Very much a layman. Um, <laughs> you know, in, in, um, so, yeah, uh, that, I hope uh, my short essay follows nicely on from Susan's, um, perhaps offers a compliment or a, or a contrast. Um, a bit rough around the edges, just a few minutes long. So it's called Between Good and Evil, Liberalism's Faustian Wager. <clears throat> so uh, man's essence is essentially his own deed, says Schelling, in his investigation into the essence of human freedom. All well and good, the modern citizen nods approvingly. This sensibility of choice fits well with 20th, 21st century liberalism and existentialism. We construct ourselves through the choices we make. However, further on in his essay, Schelling seems to commit a blasphemy to the modern mind. Noting that evil appears to a Schelling states, quote, Conversely, true good can only be affected by divine magic, namely by the immediate presence of being conscious and knowledge. True freedom is in accord with holy necessity, for God is the clear knowledge of the spiritual light itself within us, end quote. To the modern mind, Schelling's conceptualization of the good may, may be blasphemic because it goes beyond neutral conceptions of choice and advocates for us to choose good, choose God. Not only does Schelling's insistence offend in itself, since who, who today believes in God, I'm being rhetorical, but it also offends at a more fundamental level, because it advocates a normative case for choosing the good. And yet we might bridle at such an exhortation. How can a choice one is exhorted to make be a free one? Who is Schelling to tell us what is the right choice, what the right choice is? We might respond this way to Schelling's thoughts because modern, modern liberal conceptions of freedom are Faustian in that they present the right to choose between good and evil as a neutral one. Yes, but in liberalism, it is the individual who must be free to make these choices. In, in liberalism, formal freedom is the freedom to choose good or evil. In contrast, Schelling is saying that the exercise of, two free, uh, of true freedom comes in aligning with the good. This, for Schelling, is a true act of freedom since it requires the assertion of this choice. One must assert the good. However, this is not a false choice because, crucially, it takes effort. As Schelling puts it, quote, when the, define, when the divine principle of morality as such breaks through in serious disposition, then virtue appears as enthusiasm, as heroism in the battle against evil, as the lovely free courage of a man to act as God instructs him. Ultimately, I feel Schelling's exhortation towards choosing the good makes sense whether one is religious or not. We can all appreciate that feeling of being caught between making the to use religious language in a secular context, we all may feel the temptation towards sin when we know it takes effort to do what is right. This is what Schelling is reminding us of here in our liberal secular age, that it takes effort and will to make the right choice. Yet in exercising that will, we make the choice towards power too, 
towards self-control, towards self-mastery, rather than power over, being the will to assert power over the world or power over others, this being the fount of evil for Schelling. The end. Excellent. Thank you very much, James. Much different from last year's talk. Thank you. Very good one. Okay, any questions? Who's got a question for Dr. Simkin? Miguel. Yeah, uh, Dr. Simkin, James. Uh, I, I wanted to um, examine this question of uh, the way uh, Schelling provides a possibility for us to think about a, a type of belonging to a certain kind of alignment with, you know, with nature, with the cosmos, with, you know, so there's a, a, a linking of, of the whole, which to me, I mean, I, I, I associate this with a certain Spinoza background, except that Schelling brings it much more alive. But one of the uh, question for me is, isn't our notion of liberalism something that actually has stepped out of that possibilities? That because in, in the notion of liberalism, we are, are focusing so much on the notion of individuality. And with Schelling, we still have a sense of wholeness. And that in a way, it becomes very difficult. It's a big bridge to, um, to cross between the kind of thinking that we have in Schelling and probably all the other idealists as having a sense of belonging to the nature, to a, 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 a historical process, rather than being an individual who makes choices. In, in the, the liberal metaphor has left Shelling behind and becomes actually very difficult for us to understand. I, um, One of the reasons seems to be my, my yeah. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah, my 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 uh, connection broke up a little bit there. Um, please go ahead, Miguel. I, I think I had finished of me, but but my question is, I, you know, I think how is it that in a way Shelling actually becomes a very a model or someone to learn from? about what has been or could be that is actually a contrast to the modality of liberalism where we have the idea of you know individual choice rather than a sense of a, you know an, a a challenge for belonging or unity in an integrated way uh, in a very dynamic integrated way which is trying to provide through art, through you know, history, through uh, various modalities. And in liberalism, the focus on the individual making choices leaves that behind. No, and I think, I think that reflection that you mentioned there, Miguel, that's, that's exactly what struck me upon reading that as you know, a, a, a fairly um, not religious person, although I'm not anti-religion, but exactly that, we're, we're reflecting back on, on uh, Schelling's, uh, Schelling's essay there from a few hundred years ago and being struck with, it kind of confused me for a little while, you know, if, if, if you're saying that freedom uh, consists of choosing the good and choosing the God, and choosing God, as Schelling puts it, you know, to, to my mind, that, that seemed like putting things in a box or already giving you the answer that you're pointing to. But, but what enriched that choice for me and made more sense for me was, was he, him saying that, no, it, it's because it's harder to choose good. It, and, and that in choosing good, that is that real assertion of freedom. In, in a sense, it's easier to go with our you know, our base desires, um, you know, that's more structurally constrained, that's that's more the animal instincts in us, let's say. Whereas, you know, it, it, it still makes sense in that secular context, I think, to say, you know, it takes that effort, that assertion of the will, in a good sense, in that in mastery over ourselves, not other people, um, to, to, to behave in a good way. Yeah, 
So yeah, I, I'm I'm the cipher for that kind of modern liberalism that I'm steeped in. Um, looking at um, Schelling's essay, and 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 that was my response to his to his assertions there, that um, you know freedom can be defended even if you are being exhorted towards a certain path because it it, it takes more willpower to do that. I don't know if I'm making I'm answering your question well enough there, Miguel. But thank you very much. That was very good. Thank you. Excellent question. Also, you picked up, I think, on the main current there, Miguel. Uh, Barish, also outside. <laughs> yes. In his garden. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> <Sure. Park. laughs> and I'm in my favorite park in Toronto. Yeah. Uh, well, I tried to write this this morning. I've been trying to write this since the beginning of the week, but I just couldn't handle it. And I have a sense that this is something to do with Tegel, something to do with me also. Uh, something doesn't want to be determined internally. Anyway, um, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, Geist, concept of Geist in Hegel, especially from a, you know, a narrow point of recognition. Um, well, Geist, according to Hegel, uh, in his phenomenology, um, is spirit is defined as Geist is defined as uh, the universe is coming to itself, uh, starting from sense certainty, perception, and self consciousness, and reason, and then the cultural artifacts of uh, uh, human creation, and this uh, kind of phenomenologic unfolding. Uh, is the Geist itself, Geist uh, unfolding in history. And Hegel sees uh, Geist as a product of human thought and human uh, thought uh, and also its product of interaction with uh, nature. And, and as the history unfolds, the indeterminate spirit uh, becomes determined. And it is sort of could be understood as a kind of a collective uh, human agent, a grand kind of personification of human action in history and in nature. And one of, there are many interpretation of Geist that I've read. And one of the interesting ones that I've, uh, I've discovered is uh, based on recognition. And uh, he Hegel's, um, uh, recognition or Hegel's Geist is something uh, that is rooted in philosophical history. We know Hegel uh, was a good student of uh, history of philosophy, and we also know the unity of our perception, uh, mm -hmm. which, like, shortly uh, could be described as uh, this is from Johannes's notes and my reading uh, on the sixteenth. Uh, uh, paragraph or the uh, critique of uh, pure reason, and which is that uh, Kant's unity of a perception is a denotion of the unity of I handling the manifold, uh, which is a bundle of sensuous properties uh, unified in intuition and through our intuition of time and space and sensibility um, and the unit of uh, and within the unit of our perception uh, as a condition of subject know uh, as a condition of knowing the subject knows, um, uh, is able to get knowledge out of, uh, out of reality. And through this uh, unit of our perception uh, in a schematic way uh, and through categories, it's a gateway to a particular, uh, from particular to universal, which is, uh, which is sort of a, an, uh, a proto kind of uh, geist, uh, in a sense, um, that's at least how my interpretation is. Um, so starting from this uh, sort of universal eye, uh, um, uh, Hegel produced, uh, or he he Hegel uh, um, um, you know, let, let me just uh, step back a little bit. I need to talk about uh, desire also here. Um, in phenomenology, um, Hegel uh, starts at the primordial level 
And at the root of self-consciousness, uh, he states that there is desire. Uh, and this is explicitly uh, uh, states this as a primordial drive to interact with the world, to satisfy, uh, to satisfy the subject's uh, ends. And it is insatiable in a sense, and self-consciousness constantly uh, drives to consume an object, literally, literally or uh, metaphorically, and constantly moves after the consuming of an object, moves to the next object. Uh, in a sense, uh, desire is rooted partially in a, in a bestial side of the uh, human. Uh, at a, at a, a great junction in phenomenology of spirit, uh, Hegel uh, moving from the desire to, um, uh, to two self-consciousnesses uh, meeting. Hegel writes this uh, and this is, uh, this is a key paragraph from Phenomenology of Spirit. And uh, it reads as, since the self-consciousness is here the object, it is both I subject and at the same time I object. With this, the concept of Geist presents itself to us for the first time. Consciousness uh, will subsequently experience what this Geist is, this absolute ethical substance, which in perfect freedom and independence of its opposites, namely, uh, different in difference uh, independently existing self consciousness is the unit of such opposites the I that is we and we that is I. Um, in this paragraph, uh, Hegel uh, describes how two self consciousnesses treat each other um, for the first time meeting uh, two self consciousnesses meeting and. Um, Hegel's, uh, the, the thesis here is that uh, self-consciousness is constructed by, um, by the other recognizes, recognizing our uh, self-conscious. Uh, so the others endows us uh, uh, with this, uh, endows, this uh, endows us this self-consciousness through their recognition and we do the same for the others. And, through the mediation of the others, all self-consciousness uh, asserts itself, become aware of itself, uh, is the point of the uh, uh, recognition theory. And this is the social aspect of uh, being human. Um, Geist as the mythical state of nature, knowing itself as, uh, as per Schelling, through consciousness first manifesting itself in the social mode. and. Uh, humans become aware of themselves through the others uh, being aware of themselves. And in this uh, meeting to, uh, to self-consciousness, a triad, is, uh, a triad is uh, formed. It is two self-consciousnesses, I, I, and then the V uh, that is uh, mediating sort of uh, the, these two self-consciousnesses. And so ontologically, I stands on the V, uh, a community, and from the universal sense, uh, universal sense, and is the the, the indeterminate uh, is um, made from the particular sense. This is all potentialities for a particular exist for the Geist, and yet uh, only an individual can actualize the potentialities and then turn. Uh, these indeterminacies into determinacies. So the individual individual actualizes himself, herself. Um, this is sort of, um, or you know, um, and uh, another interesting uh, aspect of this is that uh, Finley, uh, F. N. Finley, uh, states uh, in uh, in his book. Uh, the self posting for the self posting I that consciousness for Hegel may therefore uh, fitly be described as the self uh, activating universal or as the universal in action. Uh, so I could be one aspect of thought as the universality uh, characteristic of all conscious uh, experience. Uh, and in a strange sense, I uh, a, a word we use to um, denote ourselves. Uh, is by nature a super personal 
is, is a usage in a super personal sense. It is uh, transcending of a particular to access the guide. And yet I also refers to a particular. So the word denotes uh, particular in unity uh, with universal. That's all I have, I guess. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Good you wrote this then, ultimately, you know, finally. Well, it's a draft. It's particular, like it's uh, pretty fragmented in nature. I realize that, that, yeah. It's fragmentary, but you know, as you know, Berish, you need deadline. Everybody need, de needs deadlines. Uh, death needs to be present <laughs> in some sense. Um, <laughs> or else it's just an endless uh, flow of, it becomes a sewage. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, it was maybe a very strong image. Uh, very good talk. I'd like to <laughs> hear. Uh, we need to find form, yeah? Um, it, it, and life needs completion from time to time or else it completely derails. So, and much different also, Bayer, you know, when you think back some of the other presentations. And now, but I have to say, you know, it's almost at the end, but uh, I think this was some of the best, one of the best seminars so far in three years. So I'd like to hear questions for, but then I see a connection between your essay and, you know, you have to keep writing on it and, and um, Susan's, for example. I think that could be fruitful on spirit. So I have a remark, but I want to actually not say anything. I'd like to hear from someone else who has a question. Anyone, please. Silence. Hmm. So in a way, what is arrived at with Hegel And you can add a few things if you want, of course, is a bringing together, as you mentioned, the self positing eye, you mentioned um, nature, etc., of all the different currents of the thinkers, either before him or at his time, in, let's say, the absolute idea. So that even the self-positing eye finds its place again and isn't um, simply gotten rid of or so. Um, in some sense, also what's very what was strong was the description of self-consciousness, because the German word for this is selbstbewusstsein. And selbstbewusstsein means in a vernacular sense, really just self-confidence. And it can also mean self-awareness, self-knowledge, self-consciousness, of course, also. But the way that Bereshi described it is that it is, out, it is at first, it's not within, withdrawn within, but towards the outside. Trying to, and has basically attempts to still its desires. Yeah. So, in a way, what Hegel does in this reading is, is allow for, in some weird way, for a, not a weird way, but it, <clears throat> so just speaking of the phenomenology, as you know, to, to anchor this in Heidegger, Heidegger also begins with the, begins with the everyday <clears throat> and then moves, high, not Heidegger, not higher, 
deeper down into the ontological. Um, from, from the ontic phenomena, he tries to see what they disclose about the ontological structures. Whereas in Hegel, we begin with self-consciousness that self-confidently establishes itself in the world and move higher and higher and higher to absolute knowledge uh, through recognition, etc., to also um, genuine um, perception. So just a few uh, remarks that I thought of during listening to you. If you'd like to respond, feel free. If not, are you? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, I think I wasn't clear enough, but um, like in Hegel's phenomenology, the explication starts from the you know most primordial in a way, not as I think primordial as Dasein in a way. Uh, because Hegel starts with touching sense, like the most uh, primitive, uh, you know, sensuous experiences, but not below that. Dasein is, I think, the most primordial it can get in philosophy, maybe. But like this desire at some point when it meets with the other consciousness, um, it's sort of transformed. And that is, I think, uh, Hegel's. Uh, Thesis is at least according to this theory, that is what uh, what the uh, what the interpretation is. Like self consciousness is formed through this meeting of other self consciousnesses. And that's what makes us sort of human. That's what makes this you know. That's that's as Hegel explicitly. This is the start of Geist. I think this is the first mm. yeah. sentence that says you know Geist starts here in meeting of two consciousnesses and then. It goes to master and slave dialectic, um, but I think like desire is sort of uh, is similar to uh, Heidegger's uh, care in a way. Like it's sort of you are constantly uh, have this intention, and that's how I understand in a way. But in Hegel, it's transformed to recognition in human society. You look for recognition uh, more so than desire yeah excellent thank you Barry so thank you everyone I think this concludes the the speakers who wanted to have this published <laughs>